Good afternoon, and thank you, President Jones, for agreeing to be part of this interview. On behalf of the Lucy Craft Laney Museum of Black History, Mustard Seed Video Productions, and the Watson Brown Foundation, we are here today to talk with President Jones, and we'll start with you sharing with us, where are you from? Well, first, I'd like to thank you all for having me. And in response to your question, I am from right here in Augusta, Georgia. I was born here and I am a product of the public schools of Augusta, having attended Ursula Collins Elementary School for first through seventh grades and then Thomas Walter Jose High School for eighth through twelfth grades. What was your upbringing like here? I was very fortunate as a young person. I grew up in a two-parent home. Both my parents were educators and at their retirement they were both in the Richmond County school systems at Richmond County school system so they had expectations of me in terms of how I would act and perform in school and what I would do. I was an only child, never had any siblings but had close friends who were very much like siblings to me. So it was a nice, comfortable environment. My parents tried to expose me to a variety of things throughout my lifetime. Do you have any memorable moments from your earlier years that you feel like helped you to choose a path in life? That's an interesting question because the path that I am on right now is not the one that I thought I was going to be on. As I indicated, both my parents were educators. My mother taught English at Lucy C. Lane High School for most of her career. My father worked in South Carolina as a principal and then in Columbia County as a teacher. And when he retired, he was principal of an elementary school here. And because I had grown up with educators, I never thought I would be in the field of education. I, during my undergraduate years, thought about maybe teaching secondary um, school. And I was going to do an education minor, as I said to myself at that time, to have something to fall back on. But I knew my primary career choice was to be a clinical child psychologist. And so when I became firmly rooted in that decision, I decided I wouldn't follow the track for secondary education. So in undergrad, I think I did everything except maybe one class in the student teaching because I wasn't going to teach. Again, I had grown up with the educators, and certainly I respected them as educators and all of the teachers who poured into me, and I respect the field of education. But at that point in my life, I just thought it was not going to be something I would do. But then I did work in clinical child psychology, and as life happens, I ended up back in Augusta and went to Payne College, where I was going to work for about a year and a half, actually and found that I really enjoyed teaching much more than I ever thought I would. And I enjoyed paying college, so I just stayed there. Thank you so much for sharing. I kind of, I would like to ask you who were some influential people? I know you shared about your parents, but I, I would like to hear more if there were any particular people who influenced you early on. One of my neighbors who was a school psychologist was very important in my life. When I would come home during my undergraduate years, we would talk about the work that she was doing as a school psychologist, some of the testing and other things that she was doing. So that was very important to me and I think helped form the career choice that I made. And certainly I had some other teachers along the way. My fifth grade teacher at Ursula Collins Elementary was very important in my life and she was not a traditional teacher. She wanted to expose students to as much as they could be exposed to. So she was very good in planning field trips and things like that and relating those experiences to what happened in the classroom. And then over at Josie, my homeroom teacher who also taught me chemistry was very influential in my life. And of course, my church family was very important 
to me as well. There were people there who were important. Did you, do you recall any particular conversations with them for you choosing a different path early on to pursue? Well, I remember being very young and there was a person who was important in my life that I thought I wanted to emulate. And I won't say who or what the career was or anything like that. And I remember my mother saying to me she thought I should choose a different career path. And so that kind of set a tone for me to think about other possibilities. And I did that. And I chose psychology, clinical child psychology, because I'd always been interested in children and thought it was a way to help children who might be experiencing some sort of psychological or emotional or socio-emotional disorders or distress. As you begin to take courses and, and I guess have conversations in class or with professors regarding psychology, did you learn anything that surprised you or was there anything that you weren't expecting I don't think I learned anything that I wasn't expecting, but I remember quite well one of the graduate courses that I had in psychology was related to, of course, psychological disorders. And I remember the very first day of the class, the professor went around and asked everybody in the class what was their diagnosis. And that was a very interesting kind of thing. question that I have for you is if you could describe your younger self as you were in undergrad specifically, how would you describe yourself? I think I evolved over my four years there. My first year was a time of me getting adjusted to being away from my parents. I was very close to my parents, and as I mentioned, I was an only child. And that was the first time I had been away for an extended period of time. So I was homesick my first year, and I talked to my parents often, came home often, because they allowed me to do that. I think they probably missed me as much as I missed them. But I grew into my four years there, and I became active, and I was involved. And I remember one of the awards that we had during our senior year was Senior Superlatives, and they had one, I forgot what it was called exactly, but the presenter described it as a person who is a bookworm who's always in the library, and that was the award that I got. So that was how my classmates saw me. And I did do studying a lot because that was important to me. I wanted to do well academically, and so I set myself on that path from the very beginning. Amazing. So I, I noted that you mentioned being an only child in a missing home. Is this the time when you decided to pledge to your sorority? No, that didn't come until later. I actually thought about it when I was an undergraduate, but I looked at other people who were joining fraternities and sororities then, and one of the things that I realized is that even though they had mandatory study halls during that time, that a number of people's grades dropped somewhat. And I, again, had set myself on this academic journey, and I didn't want that happening to me. So I did not join when I was in undergraduate school. I didn't join until I was actually in graduate school. It's very clear that you were very, very focused. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask, I noticed that you had so many leadership roles, and I'd like to ask you, how, how did you, I guess, develop the confidence to try? Have you always been a leader, or have you always had leadership roles, even from a young? Or is it something you had to grow into? 
I think I've always had leadership roles. The level of leadership, if you will, has changed over the years. And certainly when I started at Payne College about 29 years ago, I started as a faculty member. And as I, I think I said, I was only expecting to be there about a year and a half. I actually started in January, and so I was going to finish that academic year and the next year, and then I was going to go back to clinical child psychology. But as I said, I really enjoy education and really enjoy being at Payne College. And it's interesting because none of the leadership roles that I've had at Payne did I actually seek. I leaned into them after they were offered to me, but I actually did not seek any of them. And as you've suggested, I've had a number of leadership roles since I've been at Payne, at the department level, the division level, associate dean of academic affairs, executive assistant to the president, acting provost, vice president of academic affairs, and then provost, vice president of academic affairs, acting president, and now president. Do you have any stories, I guess, um, because you've literally experienced what it's like to be at every level within an organization. Can you share a story of maybe your unique approach to solving problems? Well, one of the things that I try to do is to study as quickly as I can, because some decisions have to be made fairly quickly. But I like to get input from other people, because sometimes people can help you see something that you don't see as a uh, side of the cube, if you will, that maybe you haven't looked at. And so I do try to get input from other people and review all of the information available and then make a decision. Sometimes, again, time just will not allow that, but when I can do that, I do try to seek others' opinions and insights. Have you had a situation, a circumstance where you, there was maybe another leader or someone that you had to work with and you disagreed on what the solution was, but you really knew, you really felt that you knew the right solution and you had to just keep fighting for what was right? I've been pretty close to that, especially in recent years. Sometimes there's a, a disagreement on the best approach, but we usually just kind of talk it out, and sometimes it's a compromise, and sometimes it's, you know, what one of us wants to have happen. But the goal is always, you know, as connected with my work right now, the goal is always what is best for Payne College and the students that she serves. That's foremost in my mind at all times. It's not necessarily what I want to do or what the other person wants to do, but it's what's best for the college. So in light of the time that you have spent at Payne, can you tell me about the earlier years or maybe some things that are the same today or some things that have changed? Can you just share with me about that community? It's been an interesting experience. I've enjoyed the students all along, but I can see some changes in the students. I taught entirely, exclusively for my first 10 years. I wasn't involved in leadership or anything. And I enjoyed that. The students were motivated. And I think a lot of them, if they were being honest, might have thought at the time that I was a hard instructor. I wanted to train students to be able to think critically or enhance their critical thinking skills. And they talked to me in particular about the kinds of test questions that I would give. They weren't simply questions that they could answer from memorization. They had to know concepts and then be able to apply them. And as I said, some of them at the time thought I was probably the meanest teacher, if not just on campus, but in the world. But then they come back to you years later and they thank you because something about that experience that they had to learn and apply and synthesize information came in handy in their careers or their professions. And so that's been good. Students now, I think, are still committed 
and still engaged and want to learn. But so much has changed with regard to technology, for example. Everybody has a computer basically in their hand on their phone, which was not the thing when I first started at Payne in 1992. And sometimes I think maybe that's an advantage as well as a disadvantage to students because they're used to everything happening almost instantaneously. And sometimes the real world is not like that. So students have changed because society and technology and some of the things that we have to help us have changed. Can you share, can you share your approach to facing new challenges? Because as I'm sure that as you gain leadership opportunities at different levels, the challenges are, I imagine the challenges Well, it depends on what the challenge is, but generally, I like information, I like data, I like to make decisions that are rooted in sound data. And so I'll, again, seek out information, whether or not it's from our Office of Institutional Research or Administrative and Fiscal Affairs or our Advancement Office, and see what the data indicate about whatever it is, or read the literature sometimes and see what's going on and then make an informed decision based on that as related to Payne College. And again, what's best for Payne College and her students. Do you feel like your knowledge of psychology has helped you? Oh, without a doubt. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it helps to have some people skills in the position of president because a lot of what you're doing is trying to work with people and help people work with each other. So I think that's important. Would you mind talking about maybe some differences that you feel you've experienced, particularly as a woman in leadership in the spaces that you've been in? Well, one of the things that I'm thinking of, I don't know if it's so much because I'm a woman, but one of the things that has been very difficult, well, I shouldn't say difficult, but different, has been my leading people with whom at one point in my career, I worked side by side. Because I did start out as a faculty member and a number of people were faculty members at the time and are still faculty members. And I think to then have to lead people that you were, again, working side by side brings about a change. I understand what it's like to be a faculty member. I understand those mid-level management positions. And sometimes, as president, I have to make decisions that may not be popular with faculty members. But again, I always have to ask myself, what is best for Payne College and her future? Payne College has been around for 140 years. and. I don't know what shape, form, or fashion education will be in the next 40 years. I don't think anyone can tell us that. We know it's changing, even now, with online distance education and that sort of thing. But I have to set Payne College on a course that it will be around in some form in the next 140 years. So again, sometimes I have to make hard decisions, difficult decisions that may not necessarily be pleasing to everyone. So that's been a challenge. Thank you for sharing about that. And I, I know that as being a leader and just being committed to work specifically at a historically black university and college, there has to be a sense of responsibility and obligation to preserve the legacy and history can you share with me <clears throat> about something that you're particularly proud of in terms of Payne's history that you have been able to have a direct role in preserving or um, I guess any, any part of your legacy that you're particularly proud of that you, you're responsible for and that you can take credit for? 
I don't like to take individual credit for things. It's been a team approach, and we have a good team working with us at Payne College. But one of the things that the team of Payne College achieved in 2020 was accreditation by the Transnational Association of Christian Colleges and Schools, known as TRATS. And that was very significant, very important for us. And we're very pleased that we are accredited by TRATS. And I think probably to date, that's been the single most important thing. But there are some other things. We're working to rebuild relationships in the community. And so we've started some new partnerships and new relationships and restoring some of those old ones. We're using a hashtag right now, Restore the Roar. So we're trying to restore confidence in Payne College, in the CSRA community and the nation and the world. just being so impressed and so thankful because I know that it was, I, I know that that took hard work and time. So I'm very, very grateful that y'all were able to. Thank you. Thank very, you. Very grateful. Um, do you have any advice for, I guess, anyone who is going into the field of education and wanting to or at, at the school level, um, you know, primary or, or secondary levels, what wisdom would you like to impart to educators entering the field in the near future? I think the most important thing is for them to give it their all, to do their best, to accept what may be differences among students. That doesn't mean that these differences are good or bad. They're just differences, and we have to work with students where they are to bring them along to where we want them to be. So they just have to keep at it, work hard. There are days that are going to be sort of on the top of the mountain. There may be days when they feel they're at the lowest point in the valley, but if they are steady and keep doing what they do, they will see the payoffs for the work that they're doing with the students. I am curious to know if you ever reached out to your parents for any advice or help with any situations that you faced once you actually took the jobs in education. Not really when I am trying to remember exactly what position I had. My father died early in my career. And in fact, when he passed, I was not even at pain at that point. I was moving toward coming back to pain, but I had not actually returned to Augusta. My mother passed when I think I was Associate Dean of Academic Affairs. And we never really talked much about decisions or advice or anything like that. But my mother, as were both my parents, my father as well, were praying people. And I just asked my mother to keep me in her prayers, which she did anyway. But I think she probably knew if there was something in particular that might have been weighing on me. So she was very supportive through my teaching and through, I think that was the first administrative position I had. I was very fortunate. You asked me about mentors earlier, and you may know that I am actually the second female president of Payne. It was the first female president of Payne who started me really on the administrative path. I think she probably saw something in me that made her think that I would be good as an administrator. So she appointed me to an administrative position around 95, 96 and the others just grew from there. Do you have any particular memory or characteristic from your parents that you think influenced your educational style? Or did you just take your own complete, completely unique approach? I think it was just seeing their dedication to what they were doing. I can remember them planning 
you know, their lessons when they were at home and my mother creating tests for her students or marking papers, things like that. And so I think it was probably a combination of that and some of my own things. Over the years, I heard more stories, if you will, about my mother and her teaching at Laney and at Haynes before that. And, and I see myself in some of the things that her students have shared with me. That is amazing. I do have one question. I know that you, you mentioned that you ended up going to Josie, but your mom taught at Laney. And I know that here in the modern day, there's a serious rivalry in Hanson for a while. Can you tell me what that might have been like? For you? Well, I tried to make it a good nature rivalry at one point. You'd have to know my mother to understand this comment that I'm about to share with you. And it was not mean spirited or anything like that. But we were talking about a Laney Josie game because I was in the band and I was going to play at all the games and that, that sort of thing. And I said something about Josie beating Lena and my mother in her own way just said to me, And who is it that pays your bills? and buy your clothes and your food. But again, it wasn't meant, you know, to be demeaning or demoralizing or anything like that. That was just my mother. But she didn't have to worry about me saying anything else after that because I definitely got her point. <laughs> that is just too funny. I love you so much. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. <laughs> That's the first thing I thought about when you mentioned that you actually attended Josie. Exactly. <laughs> awesome. Um, can we hear more about, <clears throat> excuse me, can we hear more about, I guess, maybe the, the community, what Augusta might have been like during your, when, when you were going to undergrad? When I was in undergrad? Yes. Well, when I was in undergrad, I wasn't in Augusta, I was in Nashville, Tennessee, and would just come home to visit my parents during the summers. But I found Augusta growing and changing, but still a very welcoming place. There were activities, you know, even in my childhood, when I was growing up through my high school days at Josie, there were things that I was involved in, things that I would go to. As I mentioned, my parents tried to expose me to a variety of different things. So, you know, some of the traditional things like movies, but. I'd go to the symphony with my godmother or to the choral society performances. Uh, my mother and her mother, my maternal grandmother, enjoyed music. My father sang too, but he didn't play the piano as my mother and her mother did. But music was very important. So again, going to concerts and symphony productions and things like that were very part of, very much an important part of my life. And uh, again, growing up in Josie, I was involved in clubs and organizations there and in the Girl Scouts and the Rosa T. Beard Debutante Club and things like that. It's a wonderful life. <clears throat> Excuse me. I apologize for getting the timeline um, messed up there. But one of the themes that I have noticed with the oral interviews is just the close-knit community that was in Augusta and how people were able to, you know, just, I guess, stay connected and it still feel like home, even if they're away. And of course, as you know, so many things have changed over time, but there's such important history in Augusta. And it seems like you and your family have been part of a very huge, huge epicenter of that, being in the institutions, involved in the institutions that you've been involved with. So I was just wondering if you might have um, heard of or just known about some of the major, some of the major um, events that may have occurred during that time in our community. One thing I'd like to ask you is, have you had a situation where in retrospect, you think you'd make a different decision or do things differently as a leader? I can't think of one. I think I have made sound decisions 
not always popular ones, but I think I have made sound decisions. I do wish sometimes the circumstances were different so that I could have made different decisions. But I think the decisions that I have had to make are the ones that I indeed had to make for the best interest of the institution. Have you ever had to make a tough decision that actually cost you something? Um, maybe, maybe a professional opportunity or just a major cost to you because of the decision you made? I can't think of anything that's actually cost me anything. Nothing comes to mind. But again, I have made decisions that have not been popular. And I don't worry about being popular as long as I know I'm making the decision that's best for the institution. But I wish other people could see things as clearly as I do because I do have the total picture from the seat in which I sit. And some people may only have a piece of the puzzle. And so they may not understand the rationale. And sometimes I'm not at liberty to tell them all of the things that go into the decision. But I can't say that that cost me anything professionally or anything like that. But it's just sometimes, you know, a comfort level, either with me or with the other person. brings up some another I think another layer or dynamic about leadership would you do you think that as you've progressed in your career that you know have you ever heard the phrase it's lonely at the top I have heard that do you find that to be accurate of your journey it can be. It can be. Because a lot of things come to you that have to be treated with confidentiality. And you can't just talk to anyone, everybody about that. And so from that point of view, it is. Um, because again, you just can't share everything with everybody. That's not the appropriate thing to do, and certainly not in the best interest of the institution or the decisions that have to be made. But on a social level, if you will, I do have friends that are very good friends, friends that I have known all of my life, literally. I don't remember not knowing. And uh, one was a little late getting into my life. She joined at eighth grade, but that's still a very long time ago. <laughs> But uh, I have a close network of friends, and we get together and, and try to socialize and just have a good time when we're able to get together. Is there anything in particular that you're excited about working on right now that you can share about? I am excited about the future of Payne College. I think it's bright, and I think we're a team that's working together and hopefully we can form some partnerships and relationships, renew some that we've had in the past and form some new ones. And I'm always looking for opportunities for our students and hopefully they will see the benefits of that with new internships and new job possibilities through the partnerships and relationships on which you're working now. Why you're working so hard? Can you describe that to me? Oh, that's a good question. 
I need a minute to think about that one. <laughs> Take your time. Take your time. <clears throat> Excuse me, please. I'd like for people to know that I did the very best that I could. And I would like to believe that when I leave the office of the president, that I left Payne College better than it was before. Again, the accreditation is paramount for any institution, and I'm glad that we were able to gain accreditation through the Transnational Association of Christian Colleges and Schools. And I'm certainly hoping that some of the partnerships and relationships on which we're working will come to fruition, and that will be very impactful for the institution. So again, just to leave it better than it was when I took the seat and to have made a difference in the lives of the students that we serve. Well, thank you so very much for taking time out to come and do this interview and to share. <clears throat> you are so impressive, your, your work and all of the things that you have accomplished are absolutely amazing and I know that you make a huge difference and impact in our community and I do believe that your legacy, I, I do believe that the community knows how hard you're fighting and I hope that, I, I truly do hope that you know the impact that you make and that you're leaving. I'm, I don't have any more questions for you but I really appreciate you participating, and especially since you don't like interviews. I really appreciate it. <laughs> well, I thank you very much for the opportunity, and I consider it an honor and a privilege to be among so many distinguished women. You or Mr. Rogers shared with me some of the women who've been interviewed, and I just deem it a total honor to be included among them. Thank you very much. Absolutely.